nearly evening. Um, mm -hmm. I'm Janice, and you are. Hello, I'm Okusia, yeah. from Ghana. We are going to talk about grassroots for innovation and sustainability. Maybe I hand it over to you first, and you can talk about. Or should I? Do you want me to start? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so I, um, I'm going to talk a bit, not so much about my job, but the people I work with. Um, one thing I'm very passionate about is I actually work as a sustainability, global sustainability director for um, the Peninsula Hotels, which is a luxury hotel company. Um, and what I do um, is I get to work with a lot of NGOs and um, Nonprofit, other nonprofit organizations, and I'll men, um, there are two that I found is super impressive that I wanted to share. Um, one of them, I'm based in Hong Kong, and actually one of the countries that we operate in is in the Philippines. And there's one um, organization called Ant Hill Fabric, and what they did was they tried to. It's all a social enterprise, and it's an amazing one because what they tried to do was how do you. Um, they were thinking, how can we preserve um, this weaving skill set that um, the older generation had? And I'm sure we have, in our own cultures, we have that sort of, some sort of skill set that we would like to preserve. Unfortunately, the designs, they're kind of costumey. So if you, let's say if you go to Cambodia or some other South Asian country, you would never wear it in your office. So they were figuring, how can we get the younger generation to appreciate this culture and heritage in everyday life. And they decided what they would do was come up with designs. I'm unfortunately I'm not wearing them because in that part of the world, winter, it does not exist. So <laughs> probably be freezing right now if I wore it. Um, but what they did was they used this weaving skill set from this tribe and turned it in and used modern designs. So they'd come up with blazers that had that sort of weave in it without making it look costumey. And the reason why my company supports them is because as, a, tour, as a, a luxury hotel, we like to highlight the cities where we operate. And you know, when you go, let's say, to Manila or you go to Bangkok, you don't necessarily expect to see European stuff. You would like to go to see more Asian, um, the Asian culture. And so the reason why we support these grassroots initiatives, particularly this one I mentioned, Ant Hill, was it managed to, ha it told us the story of a certain culture and showcased that culture in a modern way so you would actually be interested to learn more about that particular culture. So that's one. The other one that, um, and you can ask me questions later, but the other one that I also wanted to highlight was um, in, we also work with um, this organic farm um, in China and in China, they have a lot of these like um, food. That if, if you're not used to Chinese or Asian food, even I'm actually Chinese, I look. If you look at the food, you're probably not going to want to eat it. So just because it looks very questionable. <laughs> and what they did was they said, okay, how can we again preserve this um, like local Yunnan culture in China, but introduce it to the world without um, intimidating people. So what they did was, again, they did the same thing that Ant Hill did. They turned, they used these local ingredients, but um, presented it in a way that was, I guess, uh, much more identifiable if you grew up in Western culture. So we, we like to support that because at least it gets people into sustainability without intimidating them. But also it's almost like, oh, it's actually, I can actually buy into this without feeling like I'm a hippie or... Um, or it's too, it's too weird or too odd and I don't want to touch it. So that's, those are the two examples I wanted to talk about. Yeah. I will talk about Ghana and Africa. I am a princess from Ghana and my mom is a queen mother. And somewhere along the line she thought that being a queen mother has moved beyond just staying in the palace and she had to go into other things. And we went into the Millennium Development Goals, now Sustainable Development Goals. We are doing quite a few projects, but the one that I want to highlight on is the one that has to do with climate change. And it's like the issue of sustainability has become a global phenomenon over the past decades. Hunger, climate change, and depreciation of essential natural resources 
make it imperative really to judiciously manage the sort uh, the scarce resources that we have and in order to satisfy the needs of both present and future generations there is the need for us to make policies put in place things that will help our future generations to sustain because when you go to Ghana now people are burning charcoal I don't know whether people know of charcoal that's what we use to cook our foods and they are just falling the trees and they are into timber and export and looking at it we don't know where we will go in future if they fall the trees and they don't put other trees in place so we saw the need that governments have come gone done policies talked a lot about <laughs> helping the rural communities to put up sustainable things but it's just on paper it has never come to fruition so our ngo help our village foundation has picked quite a few communities that has worse conditions and we are encouraging the women to go into farming and also to try to plant trees in their farms and it's really making inroads um, one of the communities where we are doing this is the Sefi and Contobra in the central region which is not where I come from but I don't also want to stay at where I come from we want to do it in Ghana as a whole and what we do is we bring we also bring in student exchange programs whereby students come into the country to assist the women and also learn from the women and the all women also learn from them. There had been a lot of noise, Rio de Janeiro on climate change and paperwork has been done, but people has not really taken the trouble and time to really let it work. And this project, when we started, we seen that it is fruitful. And when it's managed well, it will help our future generations. I have the importance of tree planting projects. The tree planting projects uh, will help us to, uh, it will help us, the district, the project is expanded to help in carbon separation, to reduce greenhouse effects on, in our communities, like the charcoal that I talked about. And secondly, it will also help us to restore the forest cover that we've lost in our communities because we have just two seasons in Ghana. Not here, I read of the winter and I really had a bad experience when I arrived here today. <laughs> I was hearing it's cold, these degrees, and you just hear, you don't see the effect until you come into it. We have just two seasons, the rainy season and the, the <clears throat> dry season. What is happening now is because we fell in all our trees, we don't have the rain that comes from the help of the trees again. So in Ghana, farming has become a, tr a problem for the women. And we are thinking of how best we can see if we can get irrigation projects for them because they, we are mostly in dry season. We don't have any raining season again because of the ecological effects of falling the trees and, and the other things that are going on. So the challenges that we have associated with the tree planting is that there is high level of uncertainty regarding the management on, on the farms of the trees because the women are saying the tree sheds are not helping their plants to grow well. So right now we have to go into technological new house. That's why I took the opportunity to take this topic to come here and see how best people who are into this climate change and into these kind of things help us to be able to educate our women because the tree planting needs to be encouraged. It needs to be encouraged. Right now we are talking about Galamse in Ghana whereby people are mining for gold illegally and they just fall our cocoa trees and farms. So how best can we educate our women that even though they, they plant the tree, what should be the interval so that it doesn't affect their crops? Because this is miscropping farming. 
And I believe, and I'm preaching that when they do it, it will help them. Because one, the tree will give us good oxygen breathing uh, uh, air. And also, when it's on your farm, it gives your plant shade. Is it the type of crop that we are growing, which is maize, cassava? Is those things not good for the tree planted exercise? So I'm also trying to ask people who come here to look into it for us and also those who have ideas on it to let's meet and discuss it. But my conclusion is that the tree planting project in the district is very helpful and I want stakeholders and government agencies and people like my dear sister here who are into projects to come and really assist us to really make a mark. Thank you. Do you have any questions? I have two questions. So um, I'll ask one question, then ask another question to keep them in your mind. Thank you both for your presentations. Thank you particularly for your work because it is at grassroots level. And I think we need to recognize the women and the men who work at grassroots level. Because when you tell your story, you're talking about real lives and real deaths and real famine and reality. And we're a long way from that here, for here we are in Europe. And thank you for bringing your story and the power of your story into this room and into this place. My question is about the mindset, about the thinking, because where you come from, that reality is that reality. So, and the, it sounds like there's um, a conflict between the trees, let alone the gold miners and the knocking down, you know, felling the trees there. But, but where you're working with the men and the women in the villages and you're saying, don't grow this, grow trees, you know, it's, you've got to change and enable a change of mind. And they're living with this reality of, of can they see the future, you know? I mean, so my question is, I think, about how, how you keep going, because it's a tough place you're at, but also how you can enable people to see the future positively. Um, indeed, for me to come to this program, it shows that at least they are seeing the future positively. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about climate change, but the old woman in my village knows nothing about climate change. That is why I'm always attacking my government in my country when I get the chance to speak. That we always keep things at a high level and we don't bring it down for the grassroots to understand. That is my pain. Because in Ghana, most of the percentage, about 56% are women. And we are not recognized too much, when it, even when you see our government size and things. People are getting to know, but they come into this conference. I, I have come here, and it lies in me to go back home, work hard, to show that I was at the Women Economic Forum. I learned something right now from cybercrime and women in the clouds and how to keep our things in the clouds. But people come to these conferences and go back home and that is the end of it. They are getting to understand the project. They are getting to understand it. But what I've seen is, yes, when I was in the airplane, I saw irrigation farms. When the plane came down a little bit around Skipo, you can see that even here you practice irrigation farming. So how best can I try to introduce them to irrigation farming and maybe put a project in place that if you do irrigation farming and we put irrigation on your farm, you plant, let's say, 200 trees and you keep it. And those are some of the visions that I have for the future. And I believe I'll let it work. And I hope in the next three years when I come to Women Economic Forum, I have a story better to tell than this one. Thank you.
My question is a bit a reverse of that question because it seems to me that you, you have actually got a very difficult job. You are working with people who have so much money that they can afford to go to the most luxurious hotels and you're trying to educate them. And it, it's, it's almost the same question, but it's a different audience. I mean, I, I think it might have been after, I can't remember, but I, I got one of these Facebook memories and that I'd written. And it was, it's not the poor that needs education, it's the rich. <laughs> and I don't know where it had come from, but it popped up as a Facebook memory a few days ago. But in some ways, it's the rich. I mean, your country and the people in, in your villages and rural communities are facing the reality. But a lot of that reality is actually caused by the wealthy people in the world, the people who have the money to stay in these most luxurious hotels. So in some ways, how do you do your job at that level? Sorry. I always get that question. <laughs> Um, no, no, yeah, no, no. Um, yes, this is primarily the reason I love what I do. Um, so, in part of my job is to connect the dots for our guests and our shareholders, who are also very rich. And so, when I when we partner with a nonprofit organization or a social enterprise, I first have to make sure that there's there's a qual the product has quality. Because you still have to sell it to this class, like the people who buy Chanel, LVMH. It needs to feel like that. Mm -hmm. And so what I see my job and my team's job is we elevate the capacity and the capability of these tribes. Because initially, when I first started my job, we were doing, I think I was, I'd call it like pity sale. Yeah. You know, you go to Thailand and you buy a souvenir and somebody says, oh, it's for the poor. So you say, okay, but it's not, the quality is horrible. So I'm, and so I feel when I, when I was, when, when I was in that situation, I thought, but we're teaching them a skill set. They're making bags. You come back to, let's you go back to Europe. I used to live in London in the US. I go back to my, my home and I actually never use it. And that's not really sustainability, right? You're teaching them a skill that they has, you only pay them because they're poor. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in our, my job, when I, when, I had, when I had an opportunity to now lead the team, my goal was we have to be an enabler for skills that are actually needed. And they have to increase their level of quality because the reality is they are competing with the LVMHs and the Chanel's and the Carings. That is the reality. And, I, and in order to be truly sustainable, people have to buy, not just because it's from a tribe, but because I actually need it. And so, so in, in our case, what I've been, what I did, um, I've explained to my, our, our, I would say, particularly in luxury hotels like the likes of Ritz-Carlton, St. Regis, the level of quality is so high because you're dealing with very, very demanding guests. And they can immediately tell, oh, this is not good quality, whatever that may mean to them. And so what we do is we go and we work with, um, with these communities. We actually talk to them first and we tell them, I'm so sorry, but the quality of your product is not good enough yet. And this is why I can only put what I can only sell it for $1. But if you raise your quality and let's say, or sometimes people think, how can we raise the quality? How can we compete with, how can you compete with Chanel and LVMH? Perhaps number one, they have an amazing story. That story I find for very rich guests, they love stories. They love a hook. So you're always thinking, okay, you have the story. But even your, your product is gonna get even higher value if you can raise that, that quality. Because then somebody will actually use the scarf, they'll use the bag, you know what I mean? So it takes actually a longer time to train local communities. Because I think they're so used to being sold as these you know, cheap souvenirs. Then when we tell them, no, 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 we want to showcase your history, we want to showcase your culture, and it's an amazing, it's an, an amazing story. Let's leverage that because the Chanel's of the world don't have that story. And l that is your competitive advantage. And then so we're teaching, and actually funny enough, all the communities we work with are women. 
Um, it's I, you know they take care of their they can they they work in a the community they go back I think because they can take the materials with them and they can sew at home and then we can get back to see um, yeah but it's really I should say almost like how do how do we communicate with the rich guests by stealth <laughs> we have to it's almost like you have to show them this this chair it's it's they their mind gets the product immediately. And then when you tell them, and they look at it, you don't even tell them the story yet about it was made by a community. I don't want to say that. They go look at it and say, oh, my God, it's so soft. I love the design. This is so unique. And then we tell them, oh, by the way, it's also made by these local communities in the Philippines or in Thailand or whatever. And they're like, oh, my God. And then usually by that point, they don't negotiate the price. They say, how much is it? And then you just say, oh, it's maybe 100 US, when actually it costs maybe five US dollars to make. Oh, yeah, I'll buy 10. So it's, it's, that, it's the hook, you know what I mean? I didn't want them to buy it and because there was a, communi a poor community that made it. I want them to buy it because it had a unique story to tell. And then they leave and they, feel, they kind of feel good. They're like, oh, and now they now want to know more about the community. So that's how we've, there's a bit of marketing <laughs> that goes with it. But I found that that was something that a lot of our guests love. Um, and, but the one they love the most is when it's a win-win situation. When you tell the one I just mentioned, the Ant Hill Gallery community that we work with, they realize that um, they couldn't buy the raw materials, the threads. So what they did was they, um, you know, in that Southeast Asia has gets dumped with a lot of fashion, like fast fashion shirts, probably similar in Africa. Um, so they get dumped. So what they re they decided to do was, okay, we have so much of this raw material that Europe doesn't want or the U.S. doesn't want. How can we turn this into thread? So what they now they've now come up with their own zero waste capsule collection where they use these like gym shirts and they manage to weave it into the bag, or they manage to weave it and it's amazing, like because they didn't have the raw materials, <laughs> or they would go to let's say I guess like um, these clothing factories and just say, hey, do you have any extra yarn that we can use? And so it's that it's now this story. And because obviously this fast fashion and sustainability is such an in thing, the it discussion right now with fashion, fashion is now like the second most pollutive industry in the world after coal and mining. It's pretty shocking. So we're, we're actually getting more people interested in, although I don't work for them, it's just amazing as a sponsor of the organization that they're getting more and more people um, so I think for this particular group that we work with, they're now selling their products in Sweden, for example. They weave it in, in Southeast Asia, and then it's brought here. So it's kind of full circle, because actually the shirts come from Europe. And then it goes to, to Asia, and then it goes back again as a different thing. And then we tell the story about the community, and it's amazing because uh, what I've, I don't actually run the organization, but what they did was it's, um, it's a cooperative owned by the women of the tribe. And we taught them microfinance, and we taught them how to price their time. What is this one bag? So, because of course, when they negotiate with me, I mean, maybe they feel a bit of gratitude, so they'll underprice. And so, to me, sometimes it's shocking. Like they'll sell it to me for fifty U.S. cents. I'm like, are you joking? You took like five days to make this. And so it's almost like we're teaching them, no, you have to have value for, there's value in your time. So you have to explain how much is time? Well, how much would that be? And then so eventually we were teaching the women. And what's amazing is the women are actually teaching their kids. So it's, it's that kind of, it's an amazing story. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very proud of that. So that I want to see more of it because as, an, as a corporation that can channel that we have the, I think just going back, I think what I found with so many of the partnerships we've had, this is one of the very few that has been successful. And the reason was in the past, as I already said, we were selling the wrong story. We were selling a story of guilt. And when we should sell a story of, of yes, yeah, success and positive and culture and diversity. And I was surprised, regardless of what race people were in in our guests, regardless of which country they came from, even, even if it was a very, very rich Chinese man, who comes to Thailand, he doesn't, he resonates more with the story of positive and success than if we came to him with a guilt story. And it was the same whether it was a white European woman or, I was really surprised. I thought we had to have different messages, but that really surprised me. But the other thing is, 
I think the reason why this partnership worked was we know our customers and we found the right partner who could teach the community because it's also about I totally understand because you have to it's the mindset question that you asked because the the tribes women couldn't get why no 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 but our culture is to thank you and I said yeah, that's fine you can but I'm not sure you can eat that so this is you know do you know what I mean so it took a while to explain it. or when we said you have to increase your quality they kind of were offended when we said that because they were like hang on was this not good enough I thought it was good enough and they were like, no, 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 that's not what we mean. But you could get more if you did it this way. And then, but they're like, I don't want more. So it's like this conversation that we're having. So it's, it's, it's the, I think the toughest part was the mindset. The easiest part actually is the selling part. The toughest part was getting the communities to up their game and, and see things in a different way. That was the toughest part. And this is why it's actually very hard. I don't often see a successful partnership with an organization and let's say a corporation in that sense because sometimes you know I would admit as a corporation we were like come on sell 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 we have to scale 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 so there were, we had to be very patient because there would be like 10 prototypes I, get, I, I was already saying by the fifth I'm just gonna like yeah just quit while we're, we're, we're still winning but you know you kind of have to have there must be a, it's like a dance between us and the organization so yeah and just to add something, like when you work with them to, you can see that she worked with them and she fell in love with them. When you work with them and you understand them, you get to fall in love with them and you will love to do more. At a, term, a point in time, you want to quit, definitely. But when you step up the game a little bit, you see that you are helping people. And it's all about trying to change the mindset and the lifestyle of other people, as the Sustainable Development Goal 1 puts it. Just a little bit to add to it. Yeah, and just to say that I think, as you said, I had to learn not to judge the, them. Because I, I grew up in cities, right? So I'm like, oh, why can't you do it this way? I, I couldn't get why, well, why don't you want more money? So I couldn't, like, I just couldn't understand why. And it was like I, somebody said to me, you have to first seek to, un you have to listen to seek to understand, not to tell them what to do. So it was really tough. I felt like I gave birth again <laughs> without epidural, you know what I mean? Like, it felt like that. And you, know, and you, it, you could almost see, and if it, sometimes they wouldn't follow our advice. You knew that they were gonna, there, there was gonna ha a car crash was gonna happen. You just knew it just based on your experience, right? But it's almost like you have to live with them, and because that's how grassroots grassroots really means. It's tough. Um, yeah, yeah. But you're right. I did fall in love with the community, and this is probably why I didn't want to give up. <laughs> you see, I grew up. My father was a medical doctor, so I grew up in the city. I never lived in the village. What took me to the village was the fact that my mother was a queen mother, and she was always pushing for the fact that we need to help the women in the village. So at times you go and you see even the food that they are eating, even me, a Ghanaian, at times I'm like, wow, mommy, is this what they are eating? So such a person to change the mindset is very, very difficult. But when you are able to do it, that is when you become proud of yourself and you have a story to tell to say that, yes, I was able to do it. So please be encouraged to, to do more for them. And I'm also using the platform to say that you'll be coming to Ghana very soon <laughs> to, to, to do some, because you only talked about Asia. You never talked about, you never talked about Africa. So I'm also using the platform to invite you to Africa. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything you want to share or your own message? I came late, but I just yeah. saw that when you talked about corporate partnership. Yeah. Uh, he asked me to make sure uh, that everybody had the microphone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when you talked about corporate partnerships, I'm not familiar with your corporation. I don't believe so. I don't know. And um, you also said something about sustainable development goals. So. Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, are not part of everybody's parlance. So can you speak a little bit about the role of the corporation, or maybe you already addressed that, how you've helped to promote that, or 
you design this particular initiative and do you think it's important that everybody has an awareness of this or what is it that drove you in that direction? Yeah, yeah. I talked about the Sustainable Development Goals. It's a global goal that we all want to achieve. We started with the Millennium Development Goals. We were not able to achieve it. And I always say that the Millennium Development Goals were not achieved because it was always kept at the top and it was never brought down to the grassroots. And with the Sustainable Development Goals, that's why I'm always, anytime I get the platform, because it's one goal that when you sit down, 17 goals, you critically analyze it you see that if every country is able to work on at least five, the world will become a better place for all of us to set, stay in. So I have always been advocating for the fact that the sustainable development goal should all, not always be on the internet. It should not just be on TV. It should not just be the fact that the big men go and meet at New York and talk about it. My president always talks about sustainable development goals. And I don't see him doing anything on it. And he talks more about the goal five, which is about helping women. And I don't see much going on in Ghana, where I come from, uh, on, on it. So um, that's why I'm preaching it and I'm working on it so that my, at least uh, by the end of 2030, I will have a story to tell. So the Sustainable Development Goals are from the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations had a Millennium Development Goals for 20, which, 2015 or something? 15. Oh, so I used to work at the UN, yeah. so I'm familiar. Okay. I just meant, I was trying to understand. Well, then we'll and on. I just moved here from Kenya, so that's yeah. my field, but maybe it's helpful right. for the recording okay. and everything. But what I meant was, right, it's not everyone that focuses on it. And why? Why, from the corporate perspective, why you personally and why your corporation is representing it? Because, right, is it now accepted practice or is it an anomaly? And are you having a demonstration for others? You know, thanks. Actually, it's already accepted practice. So uh, almost every corporation in the world receives a letter from the United Nations. I think they figured out that they couldn't do it on their own. So. Um, our corporation and a lot of the corporations I, I'm based in Hong Kong received a letter from Paul Pullman, for example, and a couple of other CEOs who truly believe in the sustainable development goals. And basically, they said, "Look, business has to play a part. You cannot just rely on government." And obviously, we can see it in the U.S. as well. Business have to play a part, and they need to take a stand. You, in climate change, you cannot be neutral. You have to decide where you are. In, in this situation. So in our case, we decided to choose, in that letter that Paul Pullman sent, he asked all corporations, could you choose at least a couple of SDGs that you would like to focus on? In our case, I work for the Peninsula Hotels, and we chose three SDG goals, eight, 12, and 13, 11. I'll, I'll say eight is decent work and economic growth. The reason we chose eight was hospitality is going to be the second largest source of jobs, even with AI. So AI is gonna come on in online. A lot of people are gonna lose their jobs out of AI, but you can't teach a robot to care. Do you know, you, even strangely enough, it's actually hard to get a robot to clean the room, because um, even if they know which side, they can't actually tell, if they take out the watch, they don't know they're supposed to put back the watch. Is this valuable, is this not valuable? So that that level of nuance is not is very difficult to teach in, in in a robot. So this is why eight was so important. Um, and then also I think because of youth and unemployment, especially in the cities where we operate in, youth employment is quite high. So we decided we're gonna focus on eight. And then 12 was uh, responsible consumption and production, just talking about luxury. People assume luxury is overabundance. So how do we still build, build, to provide our product without, within the constraints of the planet? And also, if we're, for example, operating in China, where there's a water stress, or in California, it's a water stressed region, and we have bathtubs, what do we do about that? How can we still provide the level of luxury expected of us within these planetary constraints? And then the last one we decided to focus on is sustainable cities and communities, because all of our hotels are in cities, not in resorts. <laughs> Not, not like not resorts, all of our cities are city hotels. And then that's where I talked about our corporate partnership. 
which is we have um, a captive audience of these luxury guests, very rich customers. How do we tap into them to bring products from the rural side of the countries where we operate in? So I gave an example of the Philippines. We have a hotel in Manila, but there are so many tribes, people in the Philippines, still very, very impoverished, living below one US dollar a day. How do we bring their products and, and, and bring it to, because we we're the channel, if you like. How do we bring them and connect them to our rich guests, paying guests? And so then I was talking about you know, this, the product, how we have a souvenir shop, but we didn't want it to be like this traditional souvenir shop. It was overpriced and people were just buying because, oh, it's some tribe in the Philippines that made this. I feel bad, let me feel better about myself by buying it. So then we realized how about we turn the story around and work with an organization that could highlight Philippine culture, but bring it, but in a quality that is as good as a Chanel or an LVMH. And so that they could charge not exactly that price, but close to it. And then we can give the funds back to the community. So we, I was just talking about the experience we had and you know, how tough it was because it's, you know, for some of the people we work with, especially in the grassroots level, they don't have the skill set or they don't quite understand well, why does it have to be this level? Why? I don't really care who buys it. You know, I'm so used to the old model, which is people just buy it because I'm a tribes person. And we said, no, 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 no. We do not want that. That's, we call it the guilt story. We want another story. We want people to feel proud and we want people to buy it because there's something that you're offering and it's not guilt. So that's kind of a, the reason why. And then actually in SDG, there's 17, which is partnership and collaboration. So that was one way of us meeting SDG 17. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. No, nothing. Oh, no. I came a little late, so I couldn't really catch up. I was doing my own little session downstairs. But right. sounds yeah. great what you're talking about. I think, I think that's it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're very uh, efficient. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and we'll thank see you around. You. Thank you yeah. again.